Good evening, Georgie Peters friends and family. I would like to welcome you to our annual Strawberry Festival. Tonight, we will have a different focus. We will be celebrating the songs that have truly influenced us as Christians, hymns. Hymns have been an integral part of the church for centuries. They shape the way we view God, man, and Christ. They show us how we are to live in the light of the gospel. Hymns teach and admonish. They express joy, sorrow, brokenness, forgiveness, and grace. Tonight, I invite you to celebrate with us as we sing the songs of the faithful. Welcome to our first Strawberry Hymn Festival of Praise. Good evening. Thank you to each and every one of you for being with us today. We are pleased to be able to welcome those of you that have been here for years now. Well, of those of you who are new to the Gigi Peter family at last. This wonderful evening has arrived. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the Strawberry Festival. Hello. Hymns have always been an integral part of church service. Through all the ebbs and flows of church structure, one thing has remained meaningful. That has been the connection and spirit-filled movement of a hymn. A hymn is a song of praise. Since the time of Moses, God's people have sung hymns in honor of the Almighty God. David taught others to sing a hymn of praise, and Jesus and his disciples sang hymns at the Last Supper. Hymns help focus our attention on the glory and good of God. Tonight, we want to continue that in vain. We want to pay special attention to the hymns of Christianity. Welcome to the Strawberry Festival. Obadiah Chosom had a difficult early adult life. His health was so fragile that there were periods of time when he was confined to his bed, unable to work. Between bouts of illness, he would have to push himself to put in extra hours at various jobs in order to make ends meet. After coming out to Christ at age 27, Thomas found great comfort in the scriptures and in the fact that God was faithful to be his strength in time of illness and weakness and to provide his needs. Lamentations 3.22-23 to was one of his favorite scriptures. It is one of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his passions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father.
centuries ago, in 1772, the words for their beloved song were born from the heart, mind, and experiences of the Englishman John Newton. Knowing the story of John Newton's life as a slave trader and the journey he went through before writing the hymn will help to understand the depths of his words and his gratefulness for God's truly amazing grace. Having lived through a rather unfortunate and troubled childhood, his mother passed away when he was just six years old. Newton spent years fighting against authority, going as far as trying to desert the Royal Navy in his 20s, later abandoned by his crew in West Africa. He was forced to be a servant to a slave trader but was eventually rescued. On the return voyage to England, a violent storm hit and almost sank his ship, promoting Newton to begin his spiritual conversation as he cried out to God to save them from the storm. Upon his return, however, Newton became a slave ship master profession in which he served for several years. Bringing slaves from Africa to England over multiple trips, he admitted some treatment slaves abhorrently. In 1754, after becoming violently ill on a sea voyage, Newton ban abandoned his life as a slave trader. The slave trade CFR'd him altogether, wholeheartedly devoting his life to God's service.
amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me.
Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus was written by the most remarkable woman, Louis and I, a study. The song came out, the song came out of her darkest hours, the tragic drowning of her husband. Louisa Steed was born about 1850 in Dover, England. As a youngster, she felt the call of God upon her life for missionary service. She arrived in America in 1871, and she lived for, for a time in Cincinnati, Ohio. In 1875, Louisa married a Mr. Steed, and to this union was born a daughter, Lily. When the child was four years of age, the family decided to one day enjoy the sunny beach at Long Island Sound, New York. While eating the picnic lunch, they suddenly heard cries of help and spotted a drowning boy in the sea. As often happens, however, the struggling boy pulled his rescuer under the water with him and both drowned before the terrified eyes of wife and daughter. Out of her wife's struggle with God during the ensuring days followed these meaningful words to the soul of Louisa Steed. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know, thus saith the Lord. Oh. 
was a Canadian by birth. Born on August 21, 1869 in Nova Scotia, 
she became a school and music teacher. But when she married Dr. Walter Martin, an evangelist, she gave up teaching to travel with him and assist him with his meetings. This is her account of the writing of this song. Early in the spring of 1905, my husband and I were sojourning in Elmira, New York. We contracted a deep friendship for a couple by the name of Mr. and Mrs. Dolittle, true saints of God. Mrs. Dolittle had been bedridden for nigh 20 years. Her husband was an incurable cripple who had to propel himself to and fro his business from a wheelchair. Despite their afflictions, they lived happy Christian lives, bringing inspiration and comfort to all who knew them. One day while we were visiting with the Doolittles, my husband commented on their bright hopefulness and asked them for the secret of it. Mrs. Doolittle's reply was simple. His eye is on the sparrow and I know he watches me. The beauty of this simple expression of boundless faith ripped the hearts and fired the imagination of Dr. Martin and me. The hymn, His Eyes on the Sparrow, was the outcome of that experience. The day after writing the song, she married to the famous gospel composer, Charles Gabriel, who penned the music. Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart feel lonely and long for heaven and home? When Jesus is my portion, a constant friend is he. His eye is on the sparrow. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know He wanted me. His eye sees And I know He watches me. He watches me. Because I 
Gervin watched in shock as the body of his fiancée was pulled from the lake. Their wedding had been planned for the next day. Reeling from the tragedy, he had made up his mind to immigrate to America. Packing up his be belongings in Dublin, Ireland, he sailed for Canada, leaving his mother behind. He was about 25 years old. Ten years later, in 1855, he received word that his mother was facing a crisis. Joseph wrote this poem and sent it to her. Miss Scriven evidently gave it to a friend who had published it anonymously and it quickly became a popular hymn, though no one knew who had written it. Meanwhile, Joseph fell in love again. But tragedy stuck a second time when his bride, Eliza Catherine Roch, contracted tuberculosis and died in 1860 before the wedding could take place. To escape his sorrow, Joseph poured himself into ministry doing charity work for the Plymouth Brethren and preaching among the Baptists. A neighbor, sitting up with him in his illness, happened upon a manuscript copy of What a Friend We Have in Jesus, reading it with great delight and questioning Mr. Scriven about it. He said that he had composed it for his mother to comfort her in a time of special sorrow not intending that anyone else should see it. Yeah. 
William Cooper was one of the few hymn writers that was also recognized as a secular poet. This much beloved and yet tormented literary, literary figure was born in his father's rectory at Great Beckhampton, England on November 26, 1731. His father, George II, was a chaplain and his mother died when he was six years old. It was in boarding school where he first began suffering from frequent emotional difficulties. After graduating, he was apprenticed to a solicitor. Just as Cooper's career seemed assured, tragedy struck. When he was interviewed for the position, he suffered a panic attack. As a result, he was not awarded the position, a loss that led to a state of deep depression. During his depression, Cowper wrote one of his most beloved and controversial hymns, There is a fountain filled with blood, based on Zechariah 13 verse 1. On that day, a fountain shall be opened for the house of David in the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from their sin and impunity. The hymn is a medication of the saving power of the blood of Christ. filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains lose all Shall be till I die, and 
are a thing of the past, that they sound old-fashioned and are not needed anymore, but that cannot be further from the truth. It may seem like praise and worship courses seem to be replacing the hymns that many grew up with, but we must ensure that does not happen. Great hymns expose us to some of the greatest music ever heard and the most beautiful poetry ever penned. They give our worship a sense of majesty and beauty and turn our hearts towards God. What better way to celebrate how faithful God has been to us here at G.E. Peters School than to do it in, in the song. Thank you for worshiping with us and God bless. Oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonders consider all the worlds the hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder. Thy power, Lord, the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior, Bye. 
today. Truly, we have been blessed in ministry of song. Well, we ask that you continue to follow G.E. Peters on our G.E. Peters YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We welcome you to join us for the 2022-21-22 school year next year as well. Until then, God bless and see you again.